it's probably worth um you know taking um you know taking a minute to kind of unpack what she thought right like like what the the ayn rand worldview is um since basically my sense of this is that a lot of people do have like a slightly caricatured idea of what it was, but honestly, the real thing isn't much better than the caricature. Um, so, you know, she she makes a big deal about saying uh, that, you know, like, you know, philosophy is called objectivism. And so it's it's all about something, something, objective reality, something, something. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that she honestly knows enough about the sort of interestingly debatable issues about metaphysics or epistemology to like even succeed in saying anything uh controversial enough it's, it's funny that she was kind of emphasizing her belief in objective reality before even like the big dramas of of relativism and and postmodernism and so on in like half of the 20th century uh, <laughs> he was a farseer in her own uh, weird way. Yeah, right. Like, like who was the who was the opponent? Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, she was fighting. A, well, you know, fighting a right wing war against like a, a. I mean, they're currently fighting a right wing war against a straw man, but she was fighting it before they even built the straw man. Yeah, that that is actually <laughs> is actually kind of interesting. Um, Cause, cause yeah, I mean like that, that is an interesting question, right? You know, who's, who's the opponent? Like she, um, you know, she really hated, uh, you know, she really hated Kant, right? She was, you know, she was massively ahead of the curve on that one. Uh, I've, I've seen right wingers talk about, you know, Kant is the, um, is like the earth source of wokeness or whatever a couple of times uh in recent well, years she, she but... gave birth to this whole thing that where you can like track social evilness in like a line from plato to Kant. <laughs> yeah right uh which is interesting because aristotle is basically the only historical philosopher that she actually likes um so you know i guess the... someone <laughs> asked on um reddit asked philosophy once if this rap was a good history of um philosophy and it was an objectivist rapper who was you know tracing the lineage of aristotle the based and plato the cringe okay well you gotta said that over because that that feels like something i have to play on the show <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> it's a long time ago i'm probably, I'm probably find it <laughs> um but but yeah so um uh, so the fact that you know like Kant thinks that in a certain sense, you know, we don't have epistemic access to the things in themselves, right? Like it's, it's something she makes a big deal of uh, hating. Uh, she, you know, her her understanding of um, of like you know dialectical materialism is certainly a big uh, a big enemy there because because she thinks they deny that A is A uh and and so there's there's something there about you know objective reality but yeah you, you you would think that there would be this big like pool of objective reality deniers yeah, yeah. Who, uh, who should be setting herself up in opposition to and it's it's really um you know that that is very strange right but it's like really like certainly at least as a first pass at that stuff um and you know if certainly i, I actually read a bunch of read or reread a bunch of her essays to to write this so i i have i have to take a little break but uh if if somebody you know if anybody thinks that i'm missing something more interesting she said about these subjects i'm prepared to read like one or two more of these essays in like a month so you know so email me then but um but like certainly if you go to like the ayn rand encyclopedia online which is this you know sort of uh assembly of you know quotes from her on on different subjects in alphabetical order lovingly arranged by her disciples and you read the ones on epistemology and metaphysics in there i mean there's just nothing there i mean like that it's just uh she says um 
you know, basically she says, yeah, objective reality exists and we could know some stuff about it. Right. And congratulations, Ayn, that that was a very brave stand that you, that you took uh, by saying that. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm fairly sure that the, you know, pretty crushingly overwhelming majority of people who've ever lived have thought both of those things, you know, included a smaller majority granted, but still a majority of people who've written about philosophy uh, have, have thought both of those things. And it's, and it's just not that interesting, right? Like, like very little that's sort of um, controversial follows from any of that. Right. So, so I think my possibly uncharitable gloss on this is that, you know, by and large, the, you know, objective reality is real A is a stuff. Um, you know, Oh yeah. Shit. Everything's identical to itself. That's, that's also another, I did you say know. base when I read that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's another important Ayn Rand insight. And, you know, I said the essay, it's like the amazing thing about all this is that she just, every time she's talking about what like analytic philosophers would call Emini, right. Metaphysics and epistemology. Um, every time she touches on these subjects, like just the tone really makes it sound like she's gone into the main square of the capital city of a totalitarian dictatorship to like take out a bullhorn and tell the truth about the leader until some, you know, men in black swoop in and take her away or maybe shoot her where she stands. But like holding up a sign, all she said was to his full. Yeah. All she's saying is that stuff is identical to itself. Objective reality is real. Uh, we can know stuff about it. It's like, yeah, okay. I, I really don't think that's as controversial as you think it is. But put it all that aside. Um, in fact, I, you know, I think that uh, I think that there's um, like, you know, like she's she's getting she's making a big deal of like Aristotle pointing out many of these things, and um, you know, you know who who. Uh, was like even a lot of the people she would think of as her enemies were uh, were very very appreciative of like Aristotle's write-ins about the, these things. Mm. People like Hegel and Engels and you know Lenin, right? You know uh, has uh, this is Chris Chris uh, Skibara, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Uh, wrote a essay actually the day after this one came out that was responding to the dialectic stuff I'd done a while ago. And he has, and he, you know, he like assembles some of these quotes for these guys about Aristotle, which is why it's in my head. But in any case, my general suspicion is that the, the m &E, right. The non-normative philosophy in Ayn Rand is pretty much just window dressing. It's there to sort of um, help lend this sort of aura of profundity to uh what she actually cares about oh, yeah and i guess which is the, lend an aura of being yeah. like the only straight talker yeah exactly I, right I me. <laughs> yes yeah exactly that it's like everybody else right you know other than like aristotle and her everybody else is is trying to sell you some kind of fantastical bullshit that you know detaches from uh objective reality but you know she's here to recognize the obvious truths and there's some vague implication that once you recognize those obvious truths, you have to agree with the moral political philosophy for some reason. Uh, she's very down on, on Hume for saying that uh, there's a gap between facts and values, although like just about everybody else who's very down on this, um, she doesn't really have a coherent objection uh, to, uh, to that point. But... Uh, but yeah, I, I mean the the normative stuff is is really where the the Ayn Rand action is because look, I mean credit where credits due, that's at least where she's saying things that are interested enough to be be controversial. Um, yeah, she really is fighting the world on these points. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and, um, and so if you read this stuff so like there's a uh there's like a short collection of her essay i mean you know a lot of this is presented through the novels she's the kind of novelist who um there's never the slightest doubt about who's speaking ayn rand's thoughts in the novel so uh so really you can just read those but uh she 
she has this uh this pretty thin essay collection called the virtue of selfishness uh that you know i'd I'd read some of before and i went back and read a bunch of it to to write this and and in there uh i mean the the title says it all right uh but she's on one level very concerned to i mean you know she wants it a couple of different ways right she enjoys the shock value of that phrase the virtue of selfishness and she likes the sort of reaction that people have to it, right? She wants, she wants them to have that reaction, right? It's a little bit like, you know, so it's like given that, like the sort of complaining about people interpreting in the obvious way, it always feels a little bit like, you know, I don't know, like, uh, like if you're an Anton LaVey kind of Satanist and, you know, and you're always like, oh, see, people think we worship the devil. It's like, yeah, it's because you're calling yourself a Satanist. Like if you didn't want people to think that, you should have picked a different name. <laughs> like, uh, what do you expect? So there is there is a little bit of that. Uh, but but I also think there's some genuine ambiguity in her, her view, right? Since, um, you know, she has she has a sort of way of distancing what she thinks from what that phrase suggests, but also at the end of the day, how much distance is there really? Eh. Right? <laughs> like, I mean, the um, you say she keeps nearly just being like a straight ass Aristotelian. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I mentioned Roderick Long, who's, you know, who's somebody who unlike Ayn Rand actually does know a bunch of stuff about the history of philosophy, uh, but who has a vastly more charitable, uh, reading of Rand than I do. And, uh, and he talks about how there's this kind of, um, like Rand's notion of selfishness is ambiguous. And, you know, it has what he calls, there's like a sort of Hobbesian side to it and an Aristotelian, uh, side to it. Uh, in other words, there's a, there's an aspect to it that really kind of is what it sounds like. Uh, but then like, there's an aspect to it where like, basically whenever she wants to run away from what it sounds like sort of gets very Aristotelian is very like, well, the sort of, um, you know, the real, um, you know, somebody's just like robbing and, you know, and, and raping and pillaging, you know, then they, they have, they have like a irrational understanding of what the good life is. Uh, and, uh, so they're not actually being self-interested because they, they don't, they're not rational enough to understand what they're true. Because they're doing things I don't like. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, this is, this is the part where, where it does, it does actually get somewhat Aristotelian, uh, that, you know, she, she certainly thinks that the sort of you know, a, a genuinely good life is about sort of um, creative activity and, and, and this kind of more uh, admirable kind of sense of self-realization. Um, but at the end of the day, like even once you sort of move away from the more caricatured stuff, other people still kind of don't count, right? right? Like it's, it's, you know, other people's interests just don't need to be taken into account, like on their own account, right? Like they, they, they sort of, um, if, you know, you might have some reason why particular other people matter to you or, you know, at, at her, at the moments where she edges closest to acknowledging sort of any kind of normal notion of uh, moral responsibility to other people, you know, maybe all other people matter a little bit and we could do some wordplay to show why that's actually selfish, but like, uh, that like does verge on social contract stuff. But, um, but, but basically she, she really doesn't think that they count. So, so like, I don't know, years ago, um, actually one of the first episodes of my show, certainly within like the first dozen or so, I think, um, I did a debate with this guy, uh, Euron Brook, who's, uh, I think he is or was the, the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute. Um, and, and he, you know, he certainly, um, he certainly embraced that like 
quite explicitly. So, um, and like the, the example, you know, um, you know, the example that I think draws it out nicely is it's like, okay, look, you can, um, yeah, if you're just like stealing and raping and all of that, then that's not uh, the sort of properly understood rational uh, self interest. And there are points where she really does seem to want to sneak in some libertarian property rights that really do seem like, um, really do seem like obligations to other people. But, uh, but uh, if you, you know, yeah, you should like, you know, you should develop your own talents and capacities and, you know, and, and sort of pursue greatness. She's very like one of her examples in one of these essays is about like, um, you know, somebody like a young man uh, who, um, who, you know, she's almost always, uh, it's always, 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 always men in, in, uh, in Rand's examples for whatever reason, a uh, young man who's, um, uh, who, who doesn't pursue the career that he's really going to be good at. Cause he's going to go into the family business to please his parents. Right. That's bad. Right. Uh, Cause you're not, uh, you're not developing, you know, your, your potential, but like, look, if we put, you know, if we did like a 1% tax on the highest incomes uh, to, in order to pay for everybody to go to college, so everybody could develop their talents, et cetera, like that's something I actually brought that up to your own book. And that's something that's like the kind of thing that sort of, I think like very quickly draws out. That's like, no other people really seriously do not fucking matter. Right. Like they, she has, um, you know, like one of the examples where she's trying to do her, you know, gymnastics to show that, um, you know, that this is the sort of brute beast that people think of when they hear phrases like the virtue of selfishness, that that's, you know, that that's, that's not it, um, is, uh, that, you know, a man who, uh, who might like, spend all the money he has in the world to uh to save the life of the woman he loves because he knows so you know or maybe even die in the process right because he knows he's not gonna uh you know and that that's okay right that's actually acceptably selfish because he knows that he'll be so miserable uh if she dies that you know that that makes it like worth it to him but she explicitly says um look this is and don't we admire this man more than somebody who would be doing the, you know, actually unselfish thing, which is using the same amount of money to save, you know, several other women who that, you know, who, who don't mean anything to him. Um, <laughs> <I'm not really. laughs> and, uh, and, and just the idea that's like, okay, but like we could, you know, follow me here. We, we, we could just like, collect some money from this man and every other, you know, every other bad woman, you know, through, through taxation. And good point, though, a, ben, that's bad. <laughs> we could just have a healthcare You're system. You're doing this to rich people. people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and, and that's, and yeah. And so it's, it's like ultimately, um, you know, she's, and she even, I don't know, she's very weird on like, uh, like, like whether we ever really have, you know, it's ever like good or virtuous to like help random people. Uh, she sort of wants to have it both ways on. Uh, Cause she, it's like, look, if there's an emergency going on, like somebody's, you know, about to burn to death or something, then, you know, then maybe. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's good. Like it, it's strange that if her only thing is kind of self-fulfillment, and it, it, can't, yeah. it can't really be the case that she doesn't just say, you know, do what you will. It must yeah. have a very particular idea of like the correct subject that all persons ought to be willing towards. Yeah, right. So the fact that she's not willing to to say do what you will, that's the whole of the law is um you know, the, the only reason she's not saying that given everything else she says is that she thinks that people can just be, be wrong. I mean, you know, about what their interests are that like, that it's, I mean, I guess this is, this is the thing that like, you know, maybe, 
I, I think when she, when she goes on and on about objective reality, it's like to the extent that she's talking about like the ex, an external world existing, which is the way she presents it a lot of times, then it's very boring because everybody thinks that. But, um, but I think oftentimes there's like the slippage that she's sort of getting that like, oh, this thing would be obviously silly to deny. And really what she's building in is, oh, here's some other objective facts that there are, you know, here's what's like objectively in your interests and, um, and you're just wrong, right? If you don't think so, you know, you're not being rational if you don't think so, which is why, you know, you, you know, she has this, um, like maxim about how the interests of rational men never come into conflict. Um, which, uh, I remember in Corey Robbins' book, The Reactionary Mind. Surely that uh, happens in business like a billion times a day. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Right. So, uh, so it's, it's, it seems, it seems nutty to say that that's not the case. Uh, and she, you know, she has a lot of moves that she makes to sort of try to, 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 to wiggle out of this that, you know, like, but, I, I think that what it really amounts to is that every time we encounter an obvious, you know, counterexample, we just like ascend to a higher level of abstraction. So we're, we're not thinking about the concrete case where it clearly does happen. Um, yeah. Like, like I remember, yeah, the Corey Robin line about this is that this is just sort of, um, this is like the Rand equivalent of like a statement of faith and providence, right. That, uh, you know, it's, it's just all going to work out for some strange reason. Uh, so, so all of which is to say that Rand wants to, you know, she, even though I think she is a bit conflicted and she's not willing to go full Aleister Crowley about it, but, uh, she, you know, so she does have this kind of escape hatch strategy of like when it starts to feel a little too monstrous. Right, you go, you know, you lean into the Aristotelian side of her views and how people could be mistaken about their self interest, but also basically, fucking, it's a wonderful life is like too, too much because of the altruism, right? Like, that's the, uh, you know, you basically think, like, and even as conflicted as she is about, like, she's sort of a little slippery about whether you even, you know, whether it's even like good and virtuous to like save people from burning buildings. And she says, yeah, that might be okay. And she has all these reasons to think that that might be a, a good thing to do. But she's also very clear that just like poverty isn't, uh, isn't on that list, right? That, um, that, you know, that you shouldn't be spending your life, you know, trying to try to help those people. Right. So, so she does, she does want not just the shock value of saying that uh, selfishness is virtue and all that, but that she genuinely does want to like draw all sorts of controversial moral and political conclusions uh, from, from this, right. That, you know, that you should, you know, that it's, it's, it's good and proper that, you know, basically all your, you know, all you care about is, is, is your own, individual fulfillment and sure um you know we can put some constraints on what counts as individual fulfillment but but a lot of her examples are driven by a very like intuitive common sense kind of idea of what of what individual fulfillment uh would would be that they that it's um that it's all about um that you know that the sort of like yeah you know that you're sort of living up to your potential. You're living the best version of your life. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>